Chapter Eighteen of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter Eighteen: The Philosopher's Stone. There are many ways, says Del Rio, in which the philosopher's stone is made. Writers contest with each other which is the right way. Polandimus opposes the opinions of Brachius. Valencinus will have none of those of Trevanius. So one assails another, and all call each other foolish and ignorant. But however they may have disputed how to make it, no one succeeded in finding the right way for no one knew where to look for it, and yet the philosopher's stone was before all their eyes to be enjoyed by all alike, but to be appropriated by none. This precious stone, which went by various names, the universal elixir, the elixir of life, the water of the sun, was thought to procure its happy discoverer and possessor riches innumerable, perpetual health, a life exempt from all maladies and cares and pains, and even, in the opinion of some, immortality. It transmuted lead into gold, glass into diamonds. It opened locks. It penetrated everywhere. It was the sovereign remedy to all disease. It was luminous in the dark night. To fashion it, so the alchemist said, gold and lead iron, antimony, vitriol, sulphur, mercury, arsenic, water, fire, earth, and air were needed. To these must be added the egg of a cock and the spittle of doves. Really, said one shrewd and satiric writer, it only wanted oil, vinegar, and salt to make a salad of it. Now the curious thing is, as we shall see in the sequel, the alchemists were not far out of their opinion. All of these ingredients, or rather most of them, the cock's egg and the dove's spittle only excepted, are to be found combined in the philosopher's stone, and only recent science has established this fact. As the possessor of this stone was sure to be the most glorious, powerful, rich, and happy of mortals, as he could at will convert anything into gold, and enjoy all the pleasures of life, it is not surprising that the philosopher's stone was sought with eagerness. It was sought, but, as already said, never found, because the alchemist looked for it in just the place where it was not to be found, in their crucibles. Metals were struck on which were inscribed Persal Sulphur Mercurium Phytolopis Philosophorium, which was a simplification of the receipt. On the reverse stood, Thou Alpha and Omega of life, hope and resurrection after death. It was identified with Solomon's seal. It was called Orphanus, the one and only. It was thought at one time that the emperor had it in his crown, this Orphanus, and that it blazed like the sun at night. But the German emperors enjoyed so little prosperity that philosophers came to conclude that the stone in the imperial crown was something quite different. It brought ill luck rather than good fortune. Zosimus, who lived in the beginning of the fifth century, is one of the first in Europe to describe the powers of the stone and its capacity for making gold and silver. The alchemists pretended to derive their science from Shem, or Chem, the son of Noah and that thence came the name alchemy and chemistry. All writers upon alchemy triumphantly cite the story of the golden calf in the thirty-second chapter of Exodus to prove that Moses was an adept and could make or unmake gold at his pleasure. It is recorded that Moses was so wroth with the Israelites for their idolatry that he took the calf, which they made and burned it in the fire, and ground it into powder, and strewed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. 
This, say the alchemist, he never could have done had he not been in possession of the philosopher's stone. By no other means could he have made the powder of gold float upon the water. At Constantinople, in the fourth century, the transmutation of metals was very generally believed in, and many treatises upon the subject appeared. Linguet du Fesnoy, in his history of hermetic philosophy, gives some account of these works. The notion of the Greek writers seems to have been that all metals were composed of two ingredients, the one metallic matter, and the other red, inflammable matter that they call sulphur. The pure union of these substances formed gold, but other metals were mixed with and contaminated by various foreign ingredients. The object of the philosopher's stone was to dissolve and expel these base ingredients, and so to liberate the two original constituents whose marriage produced gold. For several centuries after the pursuit flagged or slept in Europe, but it reappeared in the eighth century among the Arabians, and from them re-extended to Europe. We are not going to trace the history of alchemy downwards, and see one student after another wreck his genius and time on this rock, but see what use was made of the belief in it by impostors to enrich themselves at the expense of the credulous. We will follow the superstition upwards, and track the stone to the spring of the belief in its supernatural powers. The search for the stone will take us through strange country, give us many scrambles, but if the reader will condescend to accompany me, I believe I shall be able to bring him to the very real and original stone itself. The following story I give, as it was told to me by some Yorkshire mill lasses, in their own delightful vernacular. I will forewarn the reader that the golden ball in the story is the same as the philosopher's stone, as you shall hear presently. There were two lasses, daughters of one mother, and as they came home from the fair, they saw a right bonny young man stand in the house door before them. He had gold on the cap, gold on the finger, gold on the neck, a red gold chain watch. Aye, but he had brass. He had a gold ball in each hand. He gave a ball to each lass, and she was to keep it, and if she lost it she was to be hanged. One of the lasses, twas the youngest, lost her ball. She was by a park palling, and she tossed the ball, and it went up, up, and up, till it went over the palling, and when she climbed to look, the ball ran along green grass, and it went right forward to the door of the house, and the ball went in, and she saw it no more. So she was taken away to be hanged by the neck, till she were dead, because she lost her ball. But she had a sweetheart, and he said he would get the ball. So he went to the park gate, but twas shut. So he climbed hedge, and when he got to the top of hedge, an old woman rose out of the dyke afore him, and said, if he would get ball, he must sleep three nights in the house. He said he would. Then he went into the house and looked for the ball, but couldn't find it. Night came on, and he heard spirits move in the courtyard. So he looked out of the window, and the yard was full of them like maggots of rotten meat. Presently he heard steps coming upstairs. He hid behind the door, and was still as a mouse. Then in came a giant five times as tall as he, and the giant looked around but did not see the lad, so he went to the window, and bowed to look out, and as he bowed on his elbow to see spirits in the yard, the lad stepped behind him, and with one blow of his sword he cut him in twain, so the top of him fell into the yard, and the bottom part stood looking out of the window, and there was a great cry from the spirits when they saw half the giant tumbling down to them and they called out, There comes half our master, give us the other half. So the lad said, Tis no use of thee, thou pair of legs standing alone in the window, so go join thy brother. And he cast the bottom part of the giant after top part. Now when the spirit had gotten all the giant, they was quiet. 
Next night the lad was at the house again, and saw a second giant come in the door. And as he came in, the lad cut him in twain, but the legs walked on to the chimney, and went up it. "'Go get thee after thy legs,' said the lad to the head, and he cast the head up the chimney too. The third night the lad got into the bed, and he heard the spirit stirring under the bed. And they had the ball there, and they was casting it to and fro. Now one of them had his leg trussing out from under the bed, so the lad brings his sword down and cuts it off. Then another thrusts his arm out at the other side of the bed, and the lad cuts that off. So at last he had maimed them all, and they all went crying and wailing off and forgot them all, and let it lig there under the bed. And the lad took it and went to seek his true love. Footnote. The portion within brackets I got from a different informant. The first version was incomplete. The girls had forgotten how the ball was recovered. They forgot also what happened with the second ball. Now the last was taken to York to be hanged. She was brought out on the scaffold, and the hangman said, Now, lass, thou must be hanged by the neck till thou beest dead. But she cried out, Stop, stop, I think I see my mother coming. O oh, mother, hast thou brought my golden ball, and come to set me free? I have neither brought thy golden ball, nor come to set thee free, but I have come to see thee hung upon the gallow tree. Then the hangman said, Now, lass, say thy prayers, for thou must dee. But she said, Stop, stop, I think I see my father coming. O oh, father, hast thou brought my golden ball, and come to set me free? I have neither brought thy golden ball, nor come to set thee free, but I have come to see thee hung upon the gallows tree. Then the hangman said, Hast thee done thy prayers? Now, lass, put thy head into the noose. And she answered, Stop, stop, I think I see my brother coming, etc. After which she excused herself, which she thought she saw her sister coming, and her uncle, then her aunt, then her cousin, each of which was related in full. After which the hangman said, I won't stop no longer. That's making game of me. But now she saw her sweetheart coming through the crowd, and he held overhead in the air her own golden ball. So she said, Stop, stop, I see my sweetheart coming. Sweetheart has brought my golden ball, and come to set me free. Ay, I have brought thy golden ball, and come to set thee free. I have not come to see thee hung upon this gallows tree. In this very curious story, the portion within the brackets reminds one of the German story of Fearless John in Grimm, of which I remember obtaining an English variant in a chapbook in Exeter when I was a child, alas, now lost. It is also found in Iceland, and is indeed a widely spread tale. The verses are like others found in Essex in connection with a child's game of Mary Brown, and those of the Swedish fair Gundula. But these points we must pass over. Our interest attaches specially to the golden ball. This story is almost certainly the remains of an old religious myth. The golden ball which one sister has is the sun, the silver ball of the other sister is the moon. The sun is lost, it sets, and the trolls, the spirits of darkness, play with it under the bed, that is, in the house of darkness, beneath the earth. But the sun is not only a golden ball, but it is also a shining stone, and here at the outset we tell our secret. The sun is the true philosopher's stone and turns all to gold, which gives health and fills with joy. In primeval times our rude forefathers were puzzled how to explain the nature of sun and moon and stars, and they thought they had hit on the interpretation of the phenomenon when they said that the stars were diamonds struck in the heavenly vault, and that the sun was a luminous stone, a carbuncle, and the moon a pearl or a silver disk. Even the classic writers have not shaken off this notion. Anaxagoria, Democritus, Metrodorus, all speak of the sun as a glowing stone, and Orpheus calls the opal the sunstone because of its analogy to that shining ball. So Pliny also. The old Norse spoke of the stars as the gemstones of heaven, so did the Anglo-Saxons. 
but perhaps the clearest idea we can have of the old cosmogony is the pictures preserved to us of the world of the dwarfs when a superior conception of the universe was general then the old heathen idea sank and what had been told of the world of men was referred to the underground world peopled by the dwarves who were the representatives of the early race conquered by the britons and by the norse and the teuton a race probably of turanian origin our british and anglo-saxon and scandinavian forefathers knew of the cosmogony of the conquered race and came to suppose that they inhabited another world to them a world of which the vault had overarched it was set with precious stones and as the aboriginal inhabitants were driven to live in caves or in huts heaped over with turf so as to be like mounds they regarded them as a subterranean people and their world would be underground in a multitude of stories the trolls or dwarves are said to live in tumuli or cairns this is nothing more than that their hovels were made of sticks stuck in the ground gathered together in the middle and turfed over the lap hut even the icelandic farmhouse look like grass mounds in many tales we hear of human children carried off by the dwarves and when these children are recovered they tell of a world in which they have been where the light is given by diamonds and a great carbuncle set in a stony black vault william of newburgh says that wolf pits near stowe market in suffolk were some of these ancient trenches out of these trenches there once came in harvest time two children a boy and a girl whose bodies were of a green color and who wore dresses of some unknown stuff they were caught and taken to the village where for many months they would eat nothing but beans they gradually lost their green color the boy soon died the girl survived and was married to a man of lynn at first they could speak no english but when they were able to do so they said that they belonged to the land of st martin an unknown country where as they were once watching their father's sheep they heard a loud noise like a ringing of the bells of st edmund's monastery and then all at once they found themselves among the reapers at wolfpit their country was a christian land and had churches there was no sun there only a faint twilight but beyond a broad river there lay a land of light Giraldus cabrinus in his itinerary of wales tells another queer story of the underground world and notices that some of the words used in it are closely related to the british tongue but in neither story are the sun and the stars spoken of as stones encrusting the vault the underground rose garden of lauren the dwarf by botson is however illumined by one great carbuncle the same sunstone a white marvellous stone reappears in the grail story which is from beginning to end a christianized celtic myth in it the grail is originally not invariably a basin or goblet but a stone it is so in wolfren von eschenbach's parsival in that there is no thought of it as a chalice it is a stone which feeds and delights all who surround cherish and venerate it whosoever the earth produces whosoever exhales whatever is good and sweet in drink and meat that yields the precious stone that never fails in the elder Eda, in the field vinsmal schwibdager is represented by climbing to the golden halls of heaven and when he comes there he asks who reigns in that place the answer given to him is mingald is her name she here holds sway and has power over these lands and glorious halls now mingald means she who rejoices in the men the precious stone that is the sun she is the holder of the sun as in the yorkshire tale the lass holds the golden ball matthew parrish says that king richard cure de leon was wont to tell the following story a rich and miserly venetian whose name was vitalis was wandering in a forest in quest of game for his table as he was about to give his daughter in marriage he fell into a pit 
that had been prepared for wild beasts, and on reaching the bottom found there a lion and a serpent. They did not injure him. By chance a charcoal burner came that way and heard the lamentations of those in the pit. Moved with pity, he fetched a rope and ladder and released all three. The lion, full of gratitude, brought the collier meat. The serpent brought him a precious stone. The Venetian thanked him and promised him a reward if he would come to his house. The poor man did so, when Vitalis refused to acknowledge any debt, and threw the collier into prison. However, he escaped and went with the lion and the serpent before the magistrates, and told them the tale, and showed them the jewel given him by the serpent. The magistrates thereupon ordered Vitalis to pay to the collier a reasonable reward. The poor man also sold the jewel for a very large sum. Richard must have heard the story in the East, there are no lions, in the Venetian territory. Moreover, the story is incomplete. We have the same story in a fuller version, in the Gesta Romanorum, a senescal rode through a wood and fell into a pit, in which there was an ape, a lion, and a serpent. A woodcutter saved them all. Next day, the woodcutter went to the castle for the promised reward, but received instead a cudgelding. The following day, the lion drove to him ten laden asses, and he had them and the treasure they bore. Next day, as he was collecting wood, and had no axe, the ape brought him boughs with which he laid his ass. On the third day, the serpent brought him a stone of three colors, by the virtue of which he won all hearts, and came to such honor that he was appointed general in command of the emperor's armies, and when the emperor heard of the stone, he bought it of the woodcutter. However, the stone always returned to the original owner, however often he parted with it. The same story occurs in Gower's Confessio Armantis. The story spread through Europe, and is found in most collection of household tales. It occurs in Grimm's Kindermachen, number 24, and Basili's Book of Neapolitan Tales, The Pentameron, number 37. All these were derived from the East and were brought to Europe by the Crusaders. The story occurs in various Oriental collections. The Pali tale is as follows. In a time of drought, a dog, a serpent, and a man fell into a pit together. An inhabitant of the Baronies draws them up in a basket, and they all promise him tokens of gratitude. The man of Baronies falls into great poverty. The dog thereupon steals the king's crown whilst he is bathing, and brings it to his preserver. The man who has been helped by the other betrays him, and the preserver is imprisoned. The poor man is about to be impaled when the serpent bites the queen, and the king learns that she can only be cured by the man who is on his way to execution. So the poor fellow is brought before the prince, and the whole story comes out. In this version the stone does not appear, nor does it in the Sanskrit Panchant Antra, but in the Mongol Siddhitkar, number 13, we have the stone again. A Brahmin delivers a mouse from children who teased it, then an ape, and lastly a bear. He falls into trouble and is put in a wooden box and thrown into the sea. The mouse comes and nibbles a hole in the box through which he can breathe, and the ape raises the lid, and the bear tears it off. Then the ape gives him a wondrous stone, which gives him who has it power to do and have all he wishes. With this he wishes himself on land, then builds a palace, and surrounds himself with servants. A caravan passes, and the leader is amazed to see the new palace, buys the stone of the man, and at once with it goes all the luck and splendor, and the Brahmin is where he was at first. Again the thankful beasts come to his aid. The mouse creeps into the palace of the new owner of the stone and discovers where he hides it, and with the aid of the bear and the ape it is again recovered. Here we have the serpent omitted, which is the principal animal to be considered, 
for really the serpent is the owner of the stone that grows in its head. This idea is very general, that the carbuncle is to be found in the serpent's head. Pliny has this notion. Indeed, it is found everywhere. The origin of the myth is that the great serpent is the heaven god, and on the Gnostic seals we have the demiurge so represented as a crowned or nimbed serpent. In the head of this great heaven god is the sun, the glorious stone that gives life and light and gladness and plenty. In the west the story is told that the emperor, Theodosius, hung in his palace a bell, and all who needed his help were to ring the bell. One day a snake came and pulled the bell. The emperor, who was blind, came out to inquire who needed him. Then he learned that a toad had invaded the nest of the serpent, so he ordered the toad to be removed. The next day the grateful serpent brought the emperor a costly stone, and bade him lay it on his eyes. When he did this he recovered his sight. The same story is told of Charlemagne. He was summoned to judge between a toad and a serpent, and decided for the latter. In gratitude the snake brought the emperor a precious stone. Charles gave it, set it in a ring, to his wife, Fastrada. It had the power to attract love. Thenceforth he was inseparable from Fastrada, and when she died he would not leave her body. They carried it about with him for eighteen years. Then a courtier removed the jewel and flung it into a hot spring at Aix-la-Chapelle. Thenceforth the emperor loved Aux above every spot in the world and would never leave it. In the story of Erisilius, the hero finds a stone that has the power of preserving the bearer from injury by water. Erisilius, armed with this stone, lies at the bottom of the Tiber as one asleep and is not drowned. In Barlam and Jehoshaphat, the hermit undertakes to give his pupil a stone, which will afford light to the blind, wisdom to fools, hearing to the deaf, and speech to the dumb. There is a strange story in the Talmud of a serpent that has a stone which gives life. A man goes in quest of it. The serpent tries to swallow the ship in which he sails. Then comes a raven and bites off the serpent's head and the sea is made red with its blood. A dragon catches the falling stone and touches the dead serpent with it. It revives and again attacks the ship. Then another bird kills the creature, and this time the man catches the stone. The power of the stone is so great that it revived salted birds that lay on the table ready to be eaten, and they flew away. In Buddhist stories, the original signification of the marvelous stone is completely lost, as completely as in the European medieval stories. The Indian Buddhist remembered that there was a wondrous stone of which strange stories had been told, and which possessed the most surprising powers, and they made use of the idea to illustrate their doctrine. The stone was no other than the secret of Buddha. He who attained to that was rich, happy, serene. It was called the, the Sinktamane, that is, the wishing stone, because he who has it has everything that can be desired. In the Buddhist collection of stories entitled The Wise Man and the Fool is the tale of the king's son, Gidon, who grieved at the misery there is in the world, goes in the quest of the Sinthamani. He takes with him his brother Digdon. They reach a castle where he is warned to strike at the door with a diamond bat. Then five hundred goddesses will come forth, each bearing a precious stone, but only one of these is the wishing stone. He must select the stone without speaking. He does so and chooses the right one. On his way home, on board ship, a storm arises, and he is wrecked, but as he bears the precious stone he is not drowned, and he saves his brother. Digdon, envious, steals the stone, and puts out his brother's eyes and goes home. Gidon, 
follows, forgives his brother, recovers the stone, and his sight. Elsewhere the wishing stone is described as giving light by night, as well as by day, as far as one hundred and twenty voices could be heard calling, and one catching and repeating to another. And by this light could be seen the seven kinds of treasures falling from heaven like a rain, which are offered to all. The idea of the marvelous, luminous, enriching, health-giving stone remains, its original significance absolutely lost, and is given a new spell of life, in that it is used as a symbol of the teaching of Buddha. In Europe, also, the idea of the marvelous stone remains. It is not used allegorically, except in the grail myth, but it haunts men's minds. They believe in it. They suppose it must be found. And they try to manufacture it out of all kinds of ingredients. Footnote. I said at the beginning of this article that the alchemists were right in believing the philosopher's stone to be complex made up of many metals. We know now that the germ idea of the stone is the sun, and the spectroscope allows us to analyze the sun's light and discover in the solar atmosphere a multitude of metals and ingredients in fusion. Neither Arab nor European alchemist nor Buddhist recluse dreamed that the stone that gave light that nourished, that rejoiced, that enriched, was the sun shining above their heads. The conception of the sun as a stone was so old, so rolled and rubbed down, that they had no notion whence it came. The idea remained and influenced their minds strangely, but it never occurred to them to ask whence the idea derived. There is something pitiful in looking at the wasted lives of those old seekers bowed over their crucibles, inhaling noxious vapors, wearing out the nights in fruitless experiment. But, like all history, that of the alchemist teaches us a lesson to look up instead of looking down, a lesson to seek happiness, wealth, contentment, in the simple and not the complex, in light instead of in darkness. I believe that this is the only one of my articles in which I have drawn a moral, but the moral is so obvious that it would have been inexcusable had I passed it over. But I know that as a child I resented the applications in Aesop's fables, and perhaps my readers will feel a like objection in having a moral appended to this essay. That I might dismiss him with a smile instead of a frown, I will close with a copy of verses extracted by me some thirty or more years ago from, I think, a Cambridge University undergraduate's magazine, verses probably new to my readers. But as they enforce the same moral in a perfectly fresh and charming manner, and as they deserve to be rescued from oblivion, I conclude with them. I was just five years old that December and a fine little promising boy. So my grandmother said, I remember, and gave me a strange-looking toy. In its shape it was lengthy and round. It was papered with yellow and blue. One end with a glass top was bounded, at the other a hole to look through. Dear Granny, what's this? I came crying. A box for my pencils? But see! I can't open it hard enough. I'm trying. Oh, what is it? What can it be? Why, my dear, if you're only looking through it and stand with your face in the light, turn it gently. That's just how to do it, and you'll see a remarkable sight. Oh, how beautiful! cried I, delighted, as I saw each fantastic device, the bright fragments now closely united all falling apart in a thrice. Times have passed, and new years will now find me, each birthday no longer a boy, yet methinks that their turns may remind me of the turns of my grandmother's toy. 
for in all this world with its beauties its pictures so bright and so fair you may vary the pleasures and duties but still the same pieces are there from the time that the earth was first founded there has never been anything new the same thoughts the same things have redounded till the colors have palled on the view but though all that is old is returning there is yet in the sameness a change and new truths are the wise ever learning for the patterns must always be strange shall we say that our days are all weary all labor and sorrow and care that its pleasures and joys are but dreary mere phantoms that vanish in air ah no there are some darker pieces and others transparent and bright but this surely the beauty increases only stand with your face in the light and to the treasures for which you are yearning those joys now succeeded by pain are but spangles just hid in the turning they will come to the surface again b so the old ideas old myths are turned and turned about and form new combinations and are ever evolving fresh beauties and teaching fresh truths perhaps in the consideration of these ancient myths and seeing their progressive modifications their breaking up their coalitions we may find the fresh application of the old saw that there is nothing new under the sun end of chapter 18 Recording by Capricia Page End of Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould